A lot of the lectures in his class are uh, examples of what could be taught in an entire class. Post-harvest physiology, actually, there are people who devote their entire career to nothing but post-harvest physiology. And in fact, our department head, Dr. Walner, uh, is a post-harvest physiologist. And his first assignment uh, working with uh, produce management was when he was in the Army. And that's where he got his, uh, his background doing uh, managing fresh produce for military. Um, but we're going to talk about mostly post-harvest physiology is for, for flowers. And everything is rooted with the molecule ethylene. And we've talked about it several times throughout the semester. Ethylene is uh, oftentimes called the ripening gas. It's a very simple organic molecule. It's colorless uh, at biological temperatures. Uh, it does require oxygen to be synthesized and used by the plant. Um, to um, uh, one of the ways that we can make it less bioactive is to increase the levels of carbon dioxide. So uh, it requires oxygen. It requires low levels of CO2 for it to be active. Now, one of the things with, with ethylene is that it is readily diffused from tissue. Uh, decaying tissue uh, will um, synthesize it and produce it in uh, copious quantities. It is um, on a metabolic pathway that's highly regulated at the genetic level in the plant uh, from a thionine, which is an amino acid. The key enzymes are uh, ACC synthase and ACC oxidase. And um, actually, the synthesis of ethylene and the presence of ethylene actually uh, will inhibit it in immature tissue and it promotes it in mature tissue. So it actually has some different changes. Once ethylene biosynthesis is starting to occur in the plant, though, it's what we call autocatalytic. In other words, it feeds on itself and in reproductive tissue in immature tissue like seeds and developing buds and stuff like this is inhibited, but in mature tissue that's close to senescence, it is autocatalytic, which means that once it starts, it can't be stopped. And one of the things that we have a problem with as far as ethylene when it's dealing with flower freshness and flower quality is that it's effective at uh, not only just parts per million level, one or two, three, four parts per million in the atmosphere, but actually as low as just 5, 10, 15 parts per billion. So it's a pretty active chemistry. And this is just kind of a, a schematic of where uh, what causes ethylene to be biosynthesized. Any abiotic or biotic stress, abiotic meaning um, drought, um, light stress, low light stress, a biotic stress such as an insect infestation or a disease infection. Um, it uh, manufactured through, there's a physiological response. We have ethylene inhibitors, which we'll talk about in a minute. And of course, ripening fruit, disease fruit, um, or exhaust from uh, internal combustion engines, any kind of pollution, is an external source which contributes to internal ethylene and they all kind of feed on each other. So the idea of this schematic is that anything that causes plants to stress is going to cause ethylene. And when we get ethylene from an outside source, it's going to cause stress and the plants are very, very responsive. So ethylene is used by many industries to stimulate certain things, and we also want to inhibit the stimulus in other crops. Um, ethylene synthesis is, is effective in what we call climacteric fruit. Um, and uh, climacteric fruit is an example of climacteric fruit includes bananas, pears, uh, avocados, and these are fruit that in their unripe stage or have high levels of starch. And during the climacteric process, ethylene, where ethylene triggers it, 
we convert those starches to sugar and it also softens the fruit. It's also uh, effective in non-climacteric fruit, for instance, citrus. Uh, we can harvest citrus uh, green and gas it with ethylene gas and cause it to ripen even though it's not going through a change where it's increasing the sugar content, where it's uh, uh, changing the respiration rates. Uh, ethylene causes um, anthocyanin synthesis in ripening fruit, which for the coloration of apples, coloration of oranges, it's responsible for chlorophyll de destruction. It, it breaks down chlorophyll, so leaves that are exposed to ethylene will start to fade in color. Some of us call that um, fall color. It's involved in the fall color development. Um, seed germination, adventitious root formation. Um, ethylene stimulates respiration rates. It's used for flower initiation and bromeliads. And ethylene is also responsible for abscission and senescence. So this is one of those cradle to the grave type of plant growth regulators. It's effective in most plants. Uh, it works with auxin transport in concert, and some people, there's, there's debate on whether auxin causes adventitious root formation or if it's ethylene causing auxin development or is auxin development causing ethylene development. We're not really sure which one is there. It's involved in shoot and root elongation, depending on the stage of growth. We can use it for color development, ripening, degreening. Uh, some uh, pecan growers and walnut growers use ethylene sprays uh, to um, cause pe the pecans to release from the tree at a stage when they want, you know, we call it dehiscence. Uh, we can use um, ethylene to change sex expression in cucurbits. Cucur most of our cucurbits are monoecious, but the first flowers are typically male, which most of us know that male flowers on a cucumber or a p pumpkin are pretty worthless, but except for that um, pollination thing. Um, promotes flowering of, of pineapple and loging of cereals. Now it has drawbacks. It accelerates senescence, but we take that to an advantage in crops like cotton in that we spray it with an ethylene compound and it causes the leaves to fall off. It can cause excessive softening of fruits and you know once a banana gets too ripe, um, it's kind of hard to use. In my house, we take those black bananas and throw them in the freezer and my wife uses them for smoothies, but that's what she does. Um, it stimulates sprouting of potatoes. Uh, we talked about chlorophyll already, and leaves, and this discoloration. So this is a, a graph of a respiration rate that reflects a, the climacteric response, and this is climacteric response in fruit. The um, y-axis re represents carbon dioxide production, in other words, respiration rates, and the bottom axis is over time. And in the pre-climacteric pre respiration rate, right here in, in the bottom of the trough, the respiration rate is its very lowest. And if we take ethylene and introduce it at this point, we're going to cause what's called a climacteric rise. And this is where the, 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 what we call the logarithmic phase of the graph. And the, um, it's during this period where bananas and avocados and pears get sweeter. Uh, and they get softer until they hit the, pre the climacteric peak. Respiration rate then is at its maximum and starts to decline. And in fact, when it starts to decline, it's actually probably, if, if there's any um, uh, respiration rate at all, it's probably bacterial infection. So this is what we call the climacteric response. A climacteric fruit, even when we introduce ethylene, the respiration rate doesn't change, but it uh, in a non-climacteric fruit like an orange or citrus, it's going to ripen, but it's not going to have a respiration rate change. 
So what does this mean for flowers? So this is carnations, and carnations are actually, actually a climacteric type of um, uh, organ where ethylene generation here, um, days after we've harvested a flower, carnation flower, where it's nice and fresh, and as it starts to mature, you can see where the ethylene rate goes down, but when it starts to fade and senesce, the ethylene jumps up, and you can see that by the time it hits the full senescence period, and the respiration rate is going to be very similar to the same pattern. They're going to mirror each other. This is where we start to see the decline of the carnation, and um, whereas this is what we want. So storing carnations and other flowers with uh, ethylene gas uh, discharge organs like apples and, and ripening fruit and stuff like that because there's an autocatalytic process that as ethylene stimulates the respiration rate and the process uh, moves forward, it's generating ethylene as well. And this was called, and this is what we call these, uh, this bud here and the, this third bud from the right, uh, right and the second bud from the right. That's what we call a sleepy carnation. And it's just kind of closed up. And they won't come out of it. And so that's one of the things you want to avoid. So one of the things that you need to do as a flower grower or flower handler is to remove all uh, the impact of ethylene. And decomposing materials, uh, rotting fruit, rotting plant material, leaking gas pipes, uh, leaking cylinder, exhaust fumes, uh, all of these things are going to cause problems with ethylene gas. So if you've got, uh, if you have to deal with any of these things, you want to make sure that you get as much fresh air as possible. Of course, we don't want to share, uh, store, or transport flowers with fruits. And this was a big problem initially for the big grocery stores when they started moving in a florist shop into their grocery store. Because the owners of the grocery stores, the, 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 big, the big CEO management types, they figured, well, flowers are fresh products, so who would be the best skilled to handle fresh, fr fresh product? The produce section. Where's the most ethylene gas? In the produce section. So they were storing f flowers and fruit in the same facilities, and they were keeping the flowers in the produce section, and the business was a failure because the flowers wouldn't last. Uh, you still see a lot of florist sections in many grocery stores close to the produce, but you'll oftentimes find that they're getting smarter about this and trying to move the fresh flowers away from the produce section. We can take... Um, Ethylene action inhibitors, and there's two primary ones in the market. One is called 1-methylcyclopropene, which is ethyl block. The other one is silver thiosulfate. Uh, the other things you can do is store your plant material at the lowest level because low temperatures reduce ethylene generation. And we want to take the field heat off the plant material as fast as possible. Now, a produce grower, what they, mean, what they do with their produce, when they bring it in out of the field to take the field heat off of it, they'll do a chilled ice bath or something like that. But in the, we can't really do that with flowers. Some flowers senesce more quickly than others with re, uh, ethylene gas. For instance, carnations, gypsophilia, which is baby's breath, a lot of rose cultivars. Um, as they age, carnations generate ethylene gas, as do product plants like sweet peas. And this, this list of plant materials is by far no limit on what there is. It's just what I chose to put up here. Um, some flowers, like snapdragons, don't produce ethylene unless you submerge the foliage of the stem underwater. So if you ever see a, a snapdragons in a florist cooler, you'll see that they've stripped all the leaves off of it before they put it in the flower, because as those leaves um, try to live under that water, they do nothing but generate ethylene gas. And of course, uh, so you want to take plants that generate ethylene gas and keep them away from the sensitive plants. So it kind of puts a conundrum on how you're going to handle your plants, because 100 parts per billion is all you need. 
So your storage areas should have low ethylene, lots of ventilation. A lot of growers will treat their flowers. In fact, I'll show you some data here in a minute. One methyl cyclopropene is now a standard in the industry and refrigerated storage, of course. So uh, one product is called 1-methylcyclopropene. It increases flower life. It's non-toxic. It prevents leaf yellowing, reduces browning, and it's effective at all biological temperatures. Um, it's called ethyl block is a common name. And what ethyl block is, is it comes as a powder. And we put it in a bucket and uh, like a teaspoon or a tablespoon of the powder, powder, put it in a five gallon bucket and then just pour a little water in it and it releases the gas, one methyl cyclopropene gas. Now it's not flammable, it's not toxic to you or anything like this, but what it does is it gets into the atmosphere and the plants take it up in their atmosphere and Ethylene activity actually parks itself on the RNA molecule. Ethylene part is, and when that ethylene attaches to the RNA molecule during protein synthesis, that's what stimulates that enzyme to kick into gear. One methyl cyclopropene actually is an inhibitor for that same biological site. So it will go into that biological site preferentially over ethylene and block that enzyme activity. That's what I mean, it works at the genetic level. So what a trucker will do, uh, a trucking company will do, is they'll take and they'll load up a plant, uh, truckload of plant material and they will release one methyl cyclopropene in the truck before they ship. And so for instance, uh, the ethylene level that you would have in a supermarket, um, this is without ethylene, ethyl block on these New Guinea patients and you can see the, the petal senescence, and you can see the ethyl block, how it's affected it. And this is data from um, Terrell Nell at, at University of Florida. And they actually have a quite a very good book on post-harvest physiology. And this is, these are geraniums. It says New Guinea patients, but these are geraniums, trust me. 1.19 uh, parts per million ethylene. And then, of course, treat it with the ethyl block, and you can see how it's prevented petal abscission. So it's becoming a shipping requirement of the flower shippers. They're required to gas their trucks during shipment because there's nothing a whole lot more stressful than being shipped across the country in a truck because it's vibrating and it's shaking and it's closed up and there's no light and all this kind of stuff. Anyway. So one of the goals we have in post-harvest physiology or in flower production as it is, is we want to extend the vase life of our flowers as long as possible. The longer they have the vase life, the happier the consumer is going to be. So one tool is rapid refrigeration to get the, down to the temperature. Uh, most cut flowers are stored best at 32 to 33.8 degrees Fahrenheit just above freezing. Of course, you go below freezing and you're, you're, you're toast. We usually use water for short-term storage. Uh, products, carnations, once they have the field heat taken off of them, they can be stored for many weeks, actually, under refrigerated conditions. We want to make sure that they, uh, we don't, we want a high humidity, but we don't want liquid water on the foliage because of botrytis infection. Botrytis is very, has a very, um, uh, has a high capacity to infect tissue that's got uh, lots of sugars like flower petals. And of course, vase life is species dependent. Clean water is a must. Actually, using deionized water uh, can increase vase life uh, two times. Most people use a flower preservative, uh, which can, has a sugar source for nutrients, for to feed the flower, for respiration rates. Uh, it contains a biocide, and the biocide is primarily there to prevent bacterial um, colonization. We also uh, put a uh, acidifier in there to take the pH down to 3.5 to 4.5. And depending on the manufacturer of your, uh, 
of your floral preservatives, they have different kinds of wetting agents, which is typically where the patents come in. And like I said, they pr pretty much vary by flower type. So this is the standard re re uh, recipe for um, what we used to call super carnations. 200 parts per million hydroxyquinoline citrate, which is a um, biocide, 3% sucrose, and silver thiosulfate. Now, silver thiosulfate is another, and it's 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 being reduced in favor because of the because of silver, because it's a heavy metal and we have to to process it. But um, silver is another example of a um, ethylene. Uh, synthesis inhibitor, and it, it, just like um, one methyl cyclopropene, it blocks that RNA site where ethylene goes into to stimulate that. The difference between silver thiosulfate and 1-MCP methyl cyclopropene is that 1-MCP is metabolized and it eventually goes into just carbon dioxide and water. Silver stays in the plant because it's, a, it's, a, it's an element and it actually recycles itself and the flower will act, actually last even longer. The plant will grow out of the 1-MCP treatment fairly quickly because it's processed. Another thing that we worry about in um, uh, plant production is because we're severing that, that flower from its root system. The first thing that's going to happen if we harvest that flower when it's rapidly transpiring is it's going to suck up air through the bottom of its vascular system. And that's an air embolism. And air, air embolisms are bad because um, the bubbles can't go very far and they block solution. So what we do is we will recut the stems, ideally recut them under clean water, low pH. Uh, some people will place them in warm water or in very cold water and or use a detergent pulse. The detergent pulse is basically a surfactant that helps break down that embolism. So another problem that we have is called bacterial plugging. When you get flowers and you let flowers sit on the table for a while, eventually the water kind of gets gray and cloudy. There's a lot of bacterial activity going on in there. So bacterial plugging is the same thing as an air embolism. And when we cut the stem, it's going to yield a lot of junk. And we get a bacterial slime. And that bacterial slime will ob obstruct the xylem. And that itself will cause blockage. This issue in a major wholesale house that's processing thousands of cuttings a day, thousands of cut flowers a day, is an issue. Because if they're not changing their water like once every 15 minutes, by the end of the day, they're just breeding bacteria by cutting underwater. So now currently, and even though I just told you a second ago to cut underwater, because that when you recut it, it's going to draw up that fresh water. If you're using nasty water with a bacterial soup, you're just making life worse. So you're going to read in the literature today that everybody's recommending dry cutting because you're not going to sanitize the stem before you cut it, right? You're moving too fast. So there are two things to do. The prevention is to use clean water, disinfect your buckets. All florists use nothing but white buckets. White buckets are important. Why would you think so? Because of dirt? You can see the dirt, right? You can see that it's dirty. Um, biocides um, are important and of course acidify. The most critical thing is to change the water regularly because it gets nasty. Other flowering handle technologies include uh, rapid chilling, keeping the flowers um, cool. Uh, cooler technology, this is an example of, of a, pallet, a pile of uh, flower boxes in a uh, warehouse where we could just stack them and have an exhaust fan pulling the air through the box. Um, 
or what they'll do is they'll take the boxes of flowers and they'll push them up to a plenum where the plenum is pulling cold air through the system to chill the flowers. And it looks like this. Uh, I'll get to it in a minute. Moving flowers directly in from the greenhouse. Uh, here is uh, roses that have been brought into for rapid cooling of roses to get them uh, ready for handling. Uh, Short-term storage in water. And a lot of growers will separate by species. For instance, they've got their lilies and other materials in another cooler. But this is a picture of the plenum and uh, with a flower box. And the, the chiller is, uh, is mounted on top and pulls the air through a vacuum. Air intake such as this. And it actually goes into the box through a hole on the end. And that's how the cold air is, is moved through a box. And they'll do this probably for about six to eight hours before they put it on an airplane to ship it to um, the distribution center. And when the distribution center gets it in, they do this again as well. So um, that's how a flower box is designed. Here's an example of um, the plenum with the chiller on top and the flower boxes pushed up on pallets up against the system and it pulls the cold air through the boxes like so. And they'll store these boxes, these are all carnations uh, store, this is the Miami Distribution Center. They'll store these boxes of carnations. And in fact, if they've been treated uh, correctly, harvested correctly, and chilled correctly, they can stay in this condition for weeks at a time. And here you can see they're very packed. They're very tight in the bud. And when the wholesale house or the florist gets them, they take them out of, the, uh, out of this immediately. The first thing they do is give it a cut to, to on the bottom to remove that air embolism, give it a fresh cut, and stick it in the uh, water. A lot of old stories are hanging around where uh, plants like mums, you should smash them with a hammer to expose more vascular tissue. Please don't do that. Why not? You're just introducing lots of tissue for infection. Okay. So clean, sharp cuts. And like I said, these are all flowers. Flower shipping, there's actually only about two or three major shippers of flowers in the United States. Most of them have what's called a dual temperature trailer, where one part of the trailer is managed at 32 to 33 degrees Fahrenheit. The other part of the trailer is managed at 45 to, six, 45 to 50 degrees Fahrenheit for, manage, for shipping both uh, uh, floral flowering uh, plants and shipping tropical foliage. So the ideal thing is uh, with a flower shipping truck is this has got a collar so they're shipping uh, during, during the appropriate uh, season. They're not worried about um, uh, getting either warm temperatures or cold temperatures into that truck and that one looks like it's just about ready to go. Not a very heavy load. In fact, um, flowers are shipped, when they're shipped by air freight, are shipped on volume, not on weight. They have a different formula because of the amount of volume that they take up in the airplane. There's a whole um, series of grading that we use. Uh, grading of flowers includes freedom from pests and diseases, <coughs> blemishes, sleepiness or exposure to ethylene, bent stems. Bent stems like will, uh, a flower grader will hold a stem out horizontal and see how far the, the head bends down. Um, slab sides, bullheads, calyces split. In other words, uh, carnation, there's too many petals 
uh, in the calyx and it splits faded colors and so forth. In fact, uh, Pi Alpha Xi National has a contest every year um, that they hold for flower judging teams. And uh, the last time CSU has won that competition was 1994. And since then, I've only had time to take and train three teams. So anyway. So grading of carnations, you'll hear uh, grading on stem length, size of flower head, quality of the stem. Roses are graded in, in increments of uh, plant length for, for primarily. The bending rates, uh, the grades include everything uh, from roses, from shorts to extra fancy. Um, long stems, larger flower heads command a higher price. And in fact, um, usually the big rose heads come from uh, Ecuador or Colombia, and the smaller rose heads come from the United States. Why do you think that would be? Climate? I can actually grow the same rose in either place. It's market difference. With a shorty and a very small designer rose, a grower can generate more stems per square foot and you actually make money, whereas in Ecuador and Peru, they can get away with fewer stems per square foot because their production costs are so much cheaper. So it's actually different production strategies. So the, the, the domestic growers actually produce a smaller, lower grade because they can generate more per square foot with their fuel costs, whereas when we're shipping things over. And it's amazing what we can ship with the, even with the price of, of airplane, uh, airline jet fuel. Grading systems, um, highly automated in many places where uh, this is a rose grader and this employee is actually um, loading roses into this hopper or taking roses out of this hopper and hanging them on this grading machine. And of course, uh, this whole environment is, um, is, is cooled. And then the grading machine brings it around, takes a picture, and it's got a picker that goes in and picks off the stem and lays it in its basket, ba uh, basket and then it's bundled. So here's a line. And what the grading machine will do is it will, from all these different stations, these will be different um, colors or different sizes or different grades of um, roses. And then they'll be bundled and moved over here for packaging. So here is the system in operation, so forth. Flowering potted, pla potted plants have ethylene sensitivities as well. It's not just cut flowers. Um, flowering potted plants could be either cold tolerant or chilling sensitive. A lot of our foliage plants are sensitive to chilling, whereas a lot of our potted plants, in other words, we can't put a poinsettia in a cooler, whereas we can put an Easter lily in a cooler. And of course, it's all based upon how well a plant has grown. Now, one of the things that happens if we have shipping problems of potted plants is sometimes it takes several days for the bud, flower buds to fall off or one or two weeks after shipping. Some crops actually do better if we back off on the fertility a week or so before we harvest the plant. For instance, a chrysanthemum, within the last 10 days to two weeks of production, there's enough fertilizer in the plant system to maintain healthy quality of flower. In fact, if we continue to fertilize it up to the day that that plant leaves the greenhouse, it's going to have a shorter vase life in the home. It's not going to last as long. Poinsettias, if we stop fertilizing them the last week or so before shipment, the bract color actually intensifies. So we need to pay attention to that. Um, So here's some, some uh, data on some different plants, like a begonia. Things to make a begonia last longer is if we terminate the fertilizers uh, beforehand, it will stay 
just as good as if we if we um, take it all the way to the end. Question. Why is that that stopping the fertilizing early is beneficial? Stopping the fertilizer early is beneficial because one of the things it does is it slows down the vegetative plant growth and allows more energy to go into that bract color. Okay. So it's actually uh, a physiological, it's, it's realigning the carbon sink is what it's doing. Okay. okay? Excellent question. So we're going to market a begonia when the flowers are mostly o open and it's going to last three to four months. So this is a begonia like a rigor begonia, a floristic begonia. And we can maximize the qual qual quality by removing ethylene and if it's got moderately good light in the greenhouse. Cyclamen, we need to terminate the fertilizer on a cyclamen a week or so before harvest. And again, cyclamens are sensitive to ethylene. And we're going to transport them at a low temperature. And of course, the longer it's in shipping, like this is nine days versus three days, the longer it's in the truck, it's going to degrade the quality. So one of the things we want to do is get the plants delivered as fast as possible. Gerbera, Gerbera daisies. This is a crop that we can continually fertilize it. It has no impact on the flowers. Ethylene sensitive. Hydrangea. Hydrangeas, which is a crop that's coming up for Mother's Day. The market starts around Easter. Again, no impact on the fertilizer if we could stop it. And it's not sensitive to ethylene. So it doesn't matter. So not everything is sensitive. And in fact, here we can see that with a 100-foot candle of light, it's 70 degrees Fahrenheit. It's going to last longer. No different at 65. But when we get the room too high, room temperature 75, even when we give it more light, it's going to respire and it's not going to last as long. The Xianthus, which is one of my favorite flowers, doesn't care if you terminate the fertilizer or not, and only a little bit sensitive to ethylene. Where do you get all this information? Well, this all comes from um, research done by Terrell Nell and Rita Leonard at uh, University of Florida. And they have a book that you can buy from the Society of American Florists that will give you all this data. OK, so there's another plant growth regulator we've talked about called fascination. And what fascination is is a product um, in the fruit industry, it's called promelin. It's a, blender, a blending of um, gibberellic acid and uh, benzaladenine, which is a cytokinin. And what we do, we use it for in the floral industry is we use it for preserving lilies. And so lilies and Easter lilies, one of the biggest problems with Easter lilies is lower leaf yellowing. And because we want Easter lilies, the minute that they're ready to be sold, even if it's a week or so before uh, Palm Sunday, we're going to put that in a cooler and stop it. But the longer it's in the cooler, the more likely we are going to have to developing yellowing foliage or ethylene senescence on that plant. So we'll spray this with uh, fascination. And um, about two weeks before, uh, about two weeks at the fluffy puffy white stage, and we can store it now for two weeks. And this product, this is taken 12 days after the plant, the flower is taken out of the cooler at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And these are the same plants on the same condition. This one was sprayed with fascination. This one was not. And in fact, all Easter lilies today are sprayed automatically with fascination before they're put into cooler to prevent that lower leaf yellowing. If you were to take a drop of cytokinin, benzyl adenine, and drop it on a green leaf, 
right before it was supposed to start fall color, that little green, that little dot that you drop the, the, the BA on will stay green until the leaf drops off because it prevents chlorophyll degradation. So that's one of the things. This work was done by Mil Bill Miller at uh, Cornell. Um, petal shatter in geraniums is a major issue. Um, zonal geraniums are susceptible to petal shatter during sh trucking. And for instance, these are racks of uh, plants that are going to uh, Texas from Welby Gardens. And this is some work that they asked us to do here at CSU. And you can see petal shatter right here. And what we looked at, this is some of the early work on 1-MCP, methylcycopropene. And we're looking at different um, cultivars of geraniums that have different um, uh, preponderances for petal shatter. Uh, Fox has the most likely to be, uh, is most sensitive to petal shatter, whereas plants like Kim are the least sensitive. And what we did in this study is we treated them with 1-methylcycopropene, then expose it to ethylene. And when we speak, uh, one, uh, these are one uh, part per million, um, 100, parts, 100 parts per billion, or 0.1 part per million, and control. And you can see that by applying 1-MCP, uh, even for about two hours, we're getting hardly any petal abscission, and you can see where we have um, no ethylene and or we're introducing exogenous ethylene here with the red graph uh, where we're eliminating the problem in this cultivar here. Um, and so this is, uh, these data are some of the data that um, are used nationally now to uh, promote the use of 1-MCP. Where did 1-MCP come from? I don't know. I don't know. Um, I know it's uh, acetylene gas has been used in the uh, ethylene industry for years as a mimic. Um, one MCP probably came about in looking at different gases to work with that. I don't know the history of that. So, Fox was the most sensitive to ethylene, and even with some. 1-MCC exposure, there's still a little bit of ethylene activity, but eventually it just goes away. So it was really helping us with petal shatter. And of course, Kim was least sensitive, but it still had an impact. And cotton candy was in the middle. And Veronica was in the middle as well. So like I said, this was work that was done here at CSU. Another um, condition that's caused by ethylene is um, droopy bracts. And droopy bracts uh, is an epinasty response. And what epinasty means is that the leaves grow down. Nothing more than that. And um, what happens is as the petal elongates, the peduncle elongates, the um, top half with exposure to uh, ethylene grows faster than the bottom half and it has a tendency to grow down just because of the growth rate. And with this, this uh, is uh, caused by plant stress. For instance, leaving a poinsettia too long in its sleeve by not relaxing the sleeve or low temperatures on poinsettias. In other words, if we ship them too cold or if we um, have them around ethylene. So here's my artistic rendering of a poinsettia leaf being exposed to ethylene. And the top half, the top side, the top group of cells grow faster than the bottom group of cells, like so. And we get a stem that does that. Droopy bracts. So. Questions about post-harvest physiology? 
In fact, most <coughs> post-harvest physiologists are actually molecular biologists because this is a good tool to study molecular biology. <coughs> 